We want to start on uh, three views on perseverance of the saints. The first one is the Arminian position that teaches that all who believe and are truly saved can lose their salvation. Sinners can lose their salvation by failing to keep up their faith or by falling into a serious sta a state of serious sin. Now, can anyone want to just rephrase this for me in your own words? And it's no, it's not salvation by works, uh, really. I don't think that would be a fair description of this view. But um, any, other, any other description? But let's try capturing this in, in, in your own words, if you can. Anyone? Yes. So, in that situation, can he still... They can lose their salvation, right? Can he or cannot? Yeah. So, that in this view, they, they will. If they in serious sin, they can lose their salvation. Uh, that, that's their view. So, in other words, if you are in a serious state of sin, or even though you believe, or you don't keep up your faith, uh, you will ultimately not be saved. Now, there is another view. Now, some people think it's just two answers. You know, some people think... Yes, I can lose my salvation. No, I cannot lose my salvation. It's not that simple. There are three views. The second view is that it's called easy believism, right? Easy believism is the view that all who make a profession of faith are eternally secure whether or not they keep up their faith. That if you make a profession of faith, you're saved. Now, anyone want to try and summarize this for us? Or give an example of it if you want. Just believe. Just believe. Uh -huh. And then, yeah, and that means you can, you can sin all you want, right? You can do whatever you want as long as you have said this sinner's prayer, which is what some people think salvation is. You're good to go. You're saved. Whatever you do, that's okay. In fact, the, any of, how many of you have heard of Joseph Prince? You've heard of Joseph Prince, right? Now, Joseph Prince teaches this. Right? Joseph Prince teaches that if you, as long as you believe, you, I mean, it's okay. It's grace. You can sin all you want. It's okay. God will still accept you. God is a loving father who will accept you no matter what you do. Uh, I'm going to say that that's not what the Bible teaches either. Right? The Bible, in fact, I think strongly condemns that. In Jude 1, verse 3 to 5, right? In Jude chapter 1, well, Jude has no chapters, verse 3 to 5, it says, Beloved, I was, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary writing to you, to, uh, appealing to you, to contend for the faith that was once and for all delivered unto the saints. For certain people have crept in whose condemnation was from long ago, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only Lord and Master, Jesus Christ. Verse 5. Now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew this, that Jesus, who saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. So Jude is pretty clear. There are people who pervert the grace of our God into licentiousness uh, and deny our only Lord and Master, Jesus Christ. And that, that is something that will result in condemnation because verse 4 says, whose condemnation was designated from long ago. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a sinful, uh, hell-bound position to have. The third view, which is the view that I hold to, and I think that it is, I'm going to be trying seeing what the scripture says. Uh, and I think the scripture teaches this, and welcome to disagree with that, is that all who are chosen by God, which is what we just read in Romans 8, those whom he foreknew, he predestined, redeemed by Christ and regenerated by the Holy Spirit, are eternally saved. They are kept in faith by the power of God Almighty, by the power of Almighty God, and therefore... If I may add, because they are kept, they continue to persevere in faith. Now, the main difference between 1 and 3 is on the order. According to number 1, you are saved if you keep up your faith. According to number 3, 
if you are saved, you will keep up your faith. See, it's a slight different. So, according to number three, you cannot lose your salvation. According to number one, you can lose your salvation. One says you can lose your salvation. Three says you cannot lose your salvation. But in a sense, there is an agreement between one and three. And one and three agree against number two, that those who uh, you know, do not live a life that, uh, you know, that, that they're living in perpetual sin, unrepentant, or that they have left the faith, or that they do not persevere in the faith, one and three agree they're not Christian, they're not saved. But according to one, they can lose the faith. According to number three, they never were saved to begin with. But both will condemn number two. Which is that, oh, if you're saved, you can, <laughs> you can do whatever you want. So I hope that it's clear. These are three different views. And I want to see what does the scriptures teach pertaining to this. Uh, so what does the scripture teach? I'm going to argue three things uh, that the scripture teaches from the scriptures. And after that, we'll try and end quickly so that we can have a time of questions, open questions like yesterday. Number one, um, a person who truly believes in Christ has new life that is eternal. In other words, that the Father dispenses eternal life to all who believe in Jesus and this eternal life is eternal. It is not temporary. Let's go to John chapter 3. Verse 1, I'll be really quick on this because you can take another hour just on this verse alone. It's Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus. In John chapter 3, was one. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Now that seems like an awfully humble thing to say, right? You've got an old Jewish rabbi who has memorized the scripture looking at a young 30 year old Jesus and saying to him rabbi that's very humble would you agree you we know you're a teacher come from God so much humility but Jesus interrupts him verse 3 Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Uh, what did Jesus just say? You, if you're not born again, Nicodemus, you can't see the kingdom of God. And, like, wh why would you say that? I, I'm just praising you. And you just tell me that if you're not born again, you can't see the kingdom of God. Jesus is telling Nicodemus a very simple lesson. You don't know who I am. <laughs> if you knew who I am, you, you would not say I'm a teacher come from God. You realize that I'm God's son. That, that's, that's who, Jesus' identity is the son of God. Nicodemus doesn't know that. He doesn't see that. But notice what Jesus diagnoses the problem. The reason he doesn't know that is not because he lacks information. He's ignorant. No, the reason he does not know that is what? He's not born again. <laughs> if he was born again, he would know that. And Jesus goes on to say, you cannot see the kingdom of God unless you're born again. Can a person be saved without being born again? No. Let me ask another question. Can a person have correct and saving faith in God before being born again? The answer is no. And at the same time, you cannot be, number one, if you do not have, you're not born again, you cannot have saving faith. On the other hand, if you are saving, if you have saving faith, you cannot not be born again. So in a sense, they both come at the same time. But one causes the other. What causes the other? The new birth leads to faith. And that's why in scripture, you're going to see time and time again, God opened their heart and they believed the gospel. God opened their hearts, they believed the gospel. We, we, we can go plenty of scriptural passages 
to demonstrate that. In fact, the Bible would say that God not only grants faith, but God even grants repentance. Let's go with me to uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2. I believe it is 2 Timothy 2. I hope my memory serves me right on this one. Yep, it's correct. So 2 Timothy 2, and I want to read verse 24. 2 Timothy 2, anyone want to read for us verse 24? All the way till the end of the chapter in 26. The Lord's born servant. Yep, that's the one. Yeah. Perhaps God may grant them repentance leading to the knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. Notice, thank you, notice what it says, that they may come to their senses, sorry, before it says they may come to their senses, that God may perhaps grant them repentance. Can God just grant repentance? Yes, that's what scripture says. Scripture says we ought to be kind to them, not so that they repent, but so that God gives them repentance. I can give you plenty of passages where that is uh, stated all over scripture, but the point still remains, Nicodemus' issue was that he was not born again. And so throughout that conversation, Jesus is going to sh share with him, what does it mean to be born again? And so Jesus is going to say, you know that that verse 6, that which is born of flesh is flesh, that which is born of spirit is spirit. Jesus is going to say uh, in verse 11, Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of the, what we know and bear witness of what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. Why does Nicodemus not receive it? It's not born again. And he goes up to talk about then was the th when you go to verse 16 of course john 3 16 is there when you come to verse 36 verse 36 says whoever believes in the son has eternal life whoever does not obey the son shall not see life but the wrath of god remains on him whoever believes in the son has eternal life but that comes in the context after jesus has told nicodemus you can't even know who i am if you're not first born again so in other words, one who truly believes in Christ is saved eternally because ultimately it is a work done by God. Not because of themselves, but it's a work done by God. Now, we go to the next one, 1 Peter uh, 1.23. Let's go there. Can someone read for us 1 Peter 1.23? And do a little bit of flipping here, but go ahead. For you have been born again, out of seed which is perishable, but imperishable that is through the living and doing word of God. Thank you. So it says, You have been born again. Now that's the same concept we read in John chapter 3. But you've been born not of perishable seed, but of imperishable. So it's not a temporary effect, you see. The born-again experience is not a temporary effect. It's an eternal one. And he goes on to say, but imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. So the, the, there is a state where the word of God lives and abides in the person perpetually. And that's how you know whether that has happened or not. Great. Let's go to the next one. John chapter 5, verse 44. Uh, John 5, 24. Uh, to 26. John chapter 5, 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me 
has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but has passed out of death into life. Paul, thanks so much. Uh, now let's go to verse 25 and 26 as well. Yeah, see, the same person. Please go ahead. Yeah. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and now is. Mm -hmm. When the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For just as the Father has life in himself, even so he gave to the Son also to have life in himself. Thanks so much. Notice what Jesus is saying here. Something so powerful. Uh, 24 says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. If you can hear his word and believe, it has eternal life. Jesus is going to associate the hearing with the believing. Which is kind of interesting. That's kind of what he accused Nicodemus of not having. You don't see the kingdom of God. And here he says, if you can hear and if you believe, you have eternal life. And he says he has passed from death to life. You see, this is a state of transformation. You were spiritually dead. Now you are spiritually alive. That is the assurance. And he goes on to say, verse 25, An hour is coming, now here, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God. Now I want to ask you, the dead here, is this talking about judgment day dead? No. It's talking about the spiritually dead. The dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. How do you know this is not judgment day dead? Because he says, the hour is now here. This present moment. Do, do, do you see what I'm saying? That there are people who are spiritually dead in sin that are going to hear the voice of God and they're going to come into spiritual eternal life that's the context now but you say but uh, that's also true of judgment day true jesus says that in verse 28 about judgment day do not marvel at this for an hour is coming when all who are in tombs will hear his voice and come out so jesus does talk about that later but here he's not talking about that so we we, we see here quite clearly that at the end of the day, a person who truly believes in Christ has this new life that is eternal. Uh, one more passage, and then we'll go to the next point. John 6, 41 to 51. This is a long one. Let me read it for you. John chapter 6, verse 41 to 51. Now, actually, you know, you know what? I don't want to start from 41. I want to start from... Thirty-five. John chapter 6, verse 35. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. So Jesus has just said something. That if you come to me, you, you, you will go, you will never hunger, you will never thirst. But yet Jesus also said to them, you have seen me, but you do not believe. And now Jesus is going to explain why is it that the Jewish people see him and they don't believe. Verse 37, all that the Father gives to me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. All that the Father gives are going to come to me. In other words, there is a group that the Father has given to Jesus. And that group is going to come to Jesus and whoever comes to Jesus he's not going to push away verse 38 for I've come down from heaven not to do my own will but the will of him who sent me and this is the will of him who sent me that I should lose nothing of all that he has given to me but should raise it to life raise it up on the last day so the father sent Jesus with a mission. The mission is that he will lose nothing of the ones that the Father has given him. So the, the Father has a group that he's going to give to Jesus. He gives it to Jesus. And Jesus' responsibility, he says, my will is to do the will of the Father. That is, I must lose not one of him who sent me. 
But then you can argue, wasn't, wasn't Judas lost? Wasn't Judas one that belonged to Jesus? The answer is no. Well, Jesus explains that to us in John 17, verse 12. Anyone want to read for us John chapter 17, verse 12? So I have not lost, thank you, I have not lost any one of those you have given me except the, the son of perdition that the scriptures will be fulfilled. So the, Jesus, Judas was not belonging to Jesus and Jesus is the one that lost, that, that was for the scriptures to be fulfilled. But I have not lost any. Can you see? So Jesus' mission, he will not lose any. So we go back to John 6 and Jesus is saying to them, you cannot come to me uh, and, or, or Jesus says here, all that the Father gives me will come to me. Th those that the Father has given to Jesus, they automatically, by the power of the Father, will be drawn to Jesus. And he's not going to throw them away. Because it's his, the will of the Father that he must, two things, not lose them. And number two, raise them up on the last day. Which means if the, those who have come to Jesus, who believe in him, are lost, Jesus failed his mission. That's in the text, not me. That's word for word Jesus, what Jesus said. Now, if you, someone who is in John 17, you may want to look at John 17, verse 9. What does John chapter 17, verse 9 say? Because Jesus is giving this report. By the way, before you read John 17, 9, uh, read also John 17, 1 and 2. Because that, that gives you the starting premise of the prayer and you're going to see the same concept there again and we're going to come back to here again go ahead Jesus spoke these things and lifting up his eyes to heaven he said father the hour has come glorify your son let the son may glorify you this too even as you gave him authority to all flesh that to all whom you have given him he may give eternal life. Thank you. So you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all flesh? No. To give eternal life to? <coughs> those you have given him. So this concept is the father has given him a group and the father has given him authority over everything but only to give eternal life to those that the father has given him. And so in verse 9, he's going to say this. And now, can you read verse 9? John 17, 9. I ask on their behalf, I do not ask on behalf of the world, but of those whom you have given me. For they are yours. Thank you. He say, Jesus says, I am praying for them. I am not praying for the whole world, but for those you gave me, for they are yours. So Jesus in his mind can draw the distinction between those that the Father has given him and those who are not. And what we are seeing in John 6 is Jesus simply saying, you see me, you don't believe me, but the ones whom the Father gives is going to come to me and I'm not going to cast them away because I did not come from heaven to do my own will, but the will of the one who sent me and the will of him who sent me is that of those he has given me, I cannot lose any. But I must raise them to life on the last day. Therein lies our confidence for the assurance of our salvation. It is not in my faithfulness. It is in the faithfulness of a perfect Savior, Jesus Christ, who can keep all that the Father has given him. That's the confidence. And now Jesus, the Jews are going to grumble at, and say, verse 41. The Jews was, grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread of life. That came down from heaven. I'm going to skip their grumbling. And Jesus is going to answer them in 43. Jesus answered them. Do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him to life on the last day. Notice again the twofold mission. You cannot come to me unless the father draws you. 
and I will raise th those who are drawn to life on the last day. That goes back to what Paul said in Romans 8. That those who he foreknew, he predestined, those whom he predestined, he called, and those whom he called, he justified. And those whom he justified, he glorified. Uh, the, the connection is the same thing. Jesus is saying the exact same thing that Paul is saying. And so what he's saying here is that when the context of people are not believing in him, Jesus explains to us the unbelief. And he says here, verse 47, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. So again, the concept of eternal life comes in. And uh, at the end of the day, uh, this is the basis for which we know we have eternal life. If we have been drawn by the Father to have faith in the Son, we have eternal life. But if you see in your heart that I don't really believe in Jesus, then you ought to question your salvation. If you see in your heart unrepentance and that you're okay with sinning without being repentant about it, you ought to ask all sorts of question marks, am I really saved? That's the balance of the Christian life. That's why the position number two that says, oh, you can just believe and do whatever you want is wrong. Because the true believer will be drawn and kept safe by Jesus. So principle number one, a person who truly believes in Christ has new life that is eternal. Number two, okay, this one needs to, it's not working. not working okay thank you all who come to genuine saving faith in Christ are kept secure in him for all eternity by the power of God so number one those who believe have eternal life number two all the gen all those who come to genuine saving faith in Christ are kept secure by him uh, for eternity by, by the power of God let's go to the few verses uh, that demonstrate that yeah next one 1 Corinthians uh, 1, verse 4 to 9. Can someone read this for us, please? It, 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 should, let's just flash it all out, uh, the, the verses, if that's okay. This is not working. Yeah, thank you. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 4 to 9. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given you in, Jesus, in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. That is everything you were enriched in Him, in all speech and all words, even as the testimony concerning Christ was confirmed in you, so that you are not lacking in any gift, awaiting eagerly the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm you to the end. Blameless the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful through whom you will call into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Once again, the emphasis and the impetus is on God's faithfulness. Do we catch that from that? That God's faithfulness is the grounds upon which we know we're secure. The same concept uh, is actually uh, in Ephesians Chapter 1, verse 11 to 14. Can someone else read that for us, please? Oh, by the way, I, I, was, I meant to mention one more thing here. And that is, verse 7 teaches, so 1 Corinthians 1, 7, uh, 1, 8 teaches that God will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son. That's that word called again. And that's the word sustained. God sustains the one he calls. Yeah, thank you. Let's go to Ephesians chapter uh, 1 verse 11. Also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will. Mm -hmm. To the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the Thank you. So, um, notice it says here in verse 11 
that in him, which is again in Christ, same concept with Romans 9, we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works out all things according to the counsel of his will. Notice the similarity with Romans 8. In Christ, all things working out for good, the counsel of God's will, and he does this so that uh, verse uh, 13, in him also when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in him, was sealed with the promise of Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire the possession of it to the praise of his glory. So the Holy Spirit is God's not only spirit to help us, it is a guarantee, it's a seal of his promise that you will be saved. That's the grounds of our assurance. Now in my limited time, what I'm going to do is just uh, give us, uh, maybe let's choose uh, 1 Peter 3, oh, 1 Peter 1 was 3 to 5, you can read the rest at home if you want to, uh, to further uh, reflect on this. But let's go to 1 Peter 1, verse 3 to 5. First Peter 1, 3 to 5, anyone? Praise God. He says, he has, verse 3, caused us to be born again. So the causation of born again is from God. And he's done this through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Verse 4, to an inheritance that is imperishable. That's, you can't be lost. Undefiled and unfading. Kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So you see this wonderful relationship that is talking about here and it's just scripture is saying the same thing over and over again. Uh, the only reason I don't want to go to Philippians 1 and, uh, and, and the Ephesians 4 is a time factor because we're, we're running a bit low on time. But what I want to show you is that scripture is saying the same thing whether you're reading Peter it's saying the same thing whether you're reading John's Gospel. It's saying the same thing whether you're reading Romans and Paul. Um, it's essentially uttering the same thing. That's how we can be assured because of God's saving power in guarding us for this eternal inheritance. Uh, next one, please. Uh, let's go to the final point. True believers will persevere to the end in faith and obedience by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, where does the scripture teach us this? Let's go to 2 Peter 1, verse 10 to 21. And can we flash all of them out, please? Okay, 2 Peter 1, uh, verse 10 to 21. And what I'll do is I'll close with 2 Peter 3, uh, which is commonly used as an objection. Okay, 2 Peter 3, 9 is usually an objection to what I'm about to say. But I'll close with that and you can read 1 John 2. Uh, let's see, if we have time, I might just do 1 John 2. Okay, but uh, 2 Peter 1.10-21, uh, I'll, I'll read that. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 10 to 21. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election, for if you practice these qualities, you will, not, you will never fail. Notice we are called to confirm the election. We're not called to make sure we are elected, as if the election was something that depends on us. We're to confirm it by practicing certain things, and if we do that, we will never fail. Verse 11, for in this way there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, I want to just stop there and say one thing. If you look through the context 
of 2 Peter chapter 1. It's a powerful thing that, you know what, let me just begin with verse 1 and I won't go, I'll stop where we stopped at verse 10. Uh, chapter 1 says this, Simeon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Do you realize that your faith is the same level of faith as Peter? Peter says this, you have the same faith, the faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. But what do the false teachers say? Oh no, you need to have more faith. You need to have more faith like me. But Peter says, you have the same faith as I have faith. Why? Why do you have the same faith that Peter has? Is it because you're as good as Peter? No, by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Because of Jesus' righteousness, you have that faith. It's not your own. If you're looking at yourself and saying, how will I be able to last my salvation until I'm, I'm, I'm ready to be take, go home with the Lord? It's not on you. It's on him. He can preserve. He's a powerful savior. Let's go to uh, verse 3. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us into his own glory and excellence by which, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of the sinful desire. Friends, can I ask you this? Does Peter say you will escape corruption of the world or you have escaped corruption of the world? Which is it? You have? Past tense. It's already done. You, you, you already have won it. Jesus did it for you. Okay, then if Jesus did it for me, then what do I need to do? Verse 5. For this reason, in other words, because you have escaped it through the righteousness of Jesus, because you have the same faith as Peter, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, virtue with knowledge, knowledge with self-control, self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities, and so you, because you are saved, because all of these things are true, because they are, you've got the same faith as the apostles, because you've got the same righteousness, do these things. So you don't do these things to get saved, you know. You, but what happens if a person who is genuinely saved is not doing this? It says to us, verse 8, For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective and unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, if you are a genuine believer, but your life does not reflect this increase of virtue and godliness and knowledge and self-control and love, the problem is not that you lost your salvation. The problem is that you are ineffective in the ministry. You are useless in the kingdom of God. That's what it is. So the goal of Christian virtue is not for salvation, but it's for effectiveness in the ministry. You do it for others. I want to be a righteous servant of God so that God will use me to bring others to the kingdom. I don't become righteous so that God will save me. That's already done. Jesus' righteousness saves me. And so you, you come to this part and you say, but what about a person who doesn't do them? Peter says, verse 9, whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he has lost his salvation. Is that what it says? No, what does it say? forgotten what did he forget that he was cleansed from his former sins see the guy who doesn't have these qualities who is a genuine believer is not going to go to hell the problem is he forgot he was saved and so the goal of christian discipleship is not to ensure people are saved it's to remind them they are saved so that's, that's discipleship I remind you, you are saved. You need to do this. It's not that if you don't do this, you won't go to heaven. No, I remind you, Jesus called you to be a light for others. If you don't do this, you're going to be ineffective. You're going to be ashamed to the gospel. You're going to bring embarrassment to the kingdom. Repent, be useful in the kingdom. Now, every godly child of God who hears that will be so motivated to want to live a godly life. But notice, when you go back to the story of Luther, that's not what he had. 
what he had is, I'm doing all these things so that at the end of the day, God will save me. That's why Luther's life was, a, was, in many ways, the start of it is so sad until he realizes, wait, I'm not doing this to be right with God. I'm already right by faith. I'm doing this because God has done this to me. I'm doing this because God loves me. I'm doing this because I want to love the world. And the moment you do that, your Christian relationship with the world and with God changes. You can truly live the great commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul and mind and love your neighbor as yourself. Only then can these two come together. Now I'm going to stop here due to time. But what I want to say here is this. I hope that you will go through the rest of these passages in your own time and look through them. But the heart of what I want to share today is this. What is the ground? Can we go to the last slide please? Of Christian assurance. It, it lies number one with uh, a person who truly believes in Christ has new life that is eternal and keep in mind that this eternal life is the initiative of God the Father it is based on the righteousness of Jesus his son it is based on the Holy Spirit who is ensuring and interceding for us according to the will of God that those whom the, those whom the Father has drawn to the Son will be kept by the Son for the day of redemption if you look at the doctrine of the Trinity pertaining to salvation, you will see that God the Father elects those who will come to his Son. In fact, in John 6, we saw the Father not only elects, he draws them to the Son. And the, it, number two, the Son dies for the sins of those that, that the Father has given to him. The Son is going to lay down his life, he's going to shed his blood, so that the Apostle Paul can say, who can hold, I mean, who can, who can condemn any one of them? Christ Jesus died, shed his blood for them. So the Father gives them to the Son, the Son dies for them. And the Holy Spirit comes and gives them new birth and preserves them, the seal of God's guarantee that they will make it to heaven. Salvation truly is a wonderful gift of God. It's not, and we've got to take away this idea that you are saved by your own works, you are not you're justified, you're made right with God by faith, and even that faith is not your own. It is a gift of God. You can share the gospel courageously to the world because you know that God saved you, not because of anything you did. So I hope that as we come through these three things, number one, a person who believes in Christ has new life because it's eternal. Those who come to genuine saving faith in Christ is a result of the triune God. They are kept secure by Him for eternity, by God's power and number three, they will persevere to the end in obedience by the power of the Holy Spirit. There's Christ, there's the Father, there's the Holy Spirit, the Blessed Trinity. Let's pray and then we'll open for a time of questions. God, we so thankful for the work of salvation that you, when we talk about the assurance of salvation, we can rest on the finished work of Christ, the the calling of God the Father and the faithfulness of the Holy Spirit in ensuring and guaranteeing our salvation. Help us not fall into the mistake of those who believe that you can just confess Christ and live like a devil and that all of it will be well. But rather help us value salvation knowing that price at which you paid for it and be encouraged by the true saving knowledge of the gospel to live a life that is worthy of that calling to call others to repentance from a position of confidence, knowing that it is God who is the author and the finisher of our faith. We pray that you will help us ground this knowledge in humility, that we serve one another in love, not to put people down and not to hurt people, but to, to build people up through the gospel, that they will be used by God to the furtherance of his kingdom. I pray for this Bible school. That you, I thank you for the vision of the president. I thank you for the vision of the founders and I pray God that you use this Bible school to draw so many more people in this area to be equipped for the ministry, to serve and that the gospel will continue to flourish in Fiji and overcome darkness. We pray this in Jesus name. Amen. I open to a short time of questions with you guys and uh, any questions you have, any objections, but I, what about this? Love to hear them. Go for it. Go for it, yeah. Uh, like some believer, yeah. they believe in Jesus and they pray they come to church. Yes. But after that, they don't go to church. And then uh, they maybe a lot of excuse, but we don't know what really they are, but they are doing. 
Yes. No, obviously. So my answer to that would be no. Uh, they're not saved. So the book of John tells us that if they left us, they never were with us in the beginning. So the key principle is this. How do you know you are saved? One of the ways you know you are saved is that you persevere till the end. In fact, that's kind of what all of those texts, this, the number three part was dealing with. Everyone that Christ draws will persevere to the end. So if you say that Christ has drawn me, but I don't persevere, I prove that I'm a liar. Christ has not saved me. So I think that's important. So I would say the vast majority in my field, now I hope I'm wrong, okay? I hope I'm wrong. But the vast majority of people in church may not even be saved. They may not be saved. Uh, yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. Uh, I'm also thinking they are not the true believers. Yes, that's what I mean. Yes. Absolutely. Fully agree. I think that one of the evidence, so in many ways, good works is not a condition for salvation. It is a consequence of salvation. Right? It is not, it, you do, you're not saved by good works, but you are saved for good works. In fact, I think it was Martin Luther that says, we are saved by faith alone, but the faith which saves is not alone. It brings good works with it. Yeah. Ephesians 2, uh, verse 8 and 9. Well, let's read until verse 10. I stopped at 9 earlier. Ephesians 2, 8. For it is by grace through faith you are saved. This is not of yourself. This is a gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. Verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works that God prepared beforehand that we might walk in them. So if a person is not walking in them, you're not saved. You don't have faith. It is not that because you didn't do this, you're not. <laughs> that, that's, it's not that because they don't come to church, you're not Christian. No, you are not saved. That's why you don't come to church. And I think that changes the way you do discipleship. Because now you go to these people, you don't go to them and tell them, uh, hey, you know, you, you, you're Christian. Why are you not going to church? No, if you're not coming to church, in my mind, you're not even a Christian. So I'm preaching the gospel to them again. Now, if they are really Christian and God convicts them, that's glory to God. But I'm going to assume if you're not coming to church and you call yourself a Christian, in my mind, you're not a Christian. I'm not judging you. But I'm going to treat you like an unbeliever when I share the gospel with you. Right? I'm not, I'm, because otherwise, we assume that everyone is saved. Sometimes there are people in church that don't want to live that way and you put your hand and say, brother, you're a Christian. Why? They're not. Who are you to tell them you're a Christian? You're not. Christ tells them you're a Christian. The Father tells them you're a Christian, not me. I think it was Paul Washer that rightly said, you never tell people they are saved. God tells them they are saved. You tell them how to get saved. Believe the gospel. Repent. Right. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Anyone else? Yeah. Yeah, please. Yes, I have one question. Like all these truths that we hear, that we've spoken of about salvation, why is it that certain people, although they hear the truth and they seem to understand yes. the idea and the concept of like, the idea of salvation, how yeah. it works, why is it hard for them to accept it? Like, why is it some of them just can't accept it? Is it because of predestination? Or I, I think predestination has been a stumbling block for a lot of people. Um, at the heart of it, Ultimately, is people are scared if it's up to God. Part of it, maybe they don't trust God. But the part of it is like, I, I want to have some say in my salvation. I want to know that I did something about it. Now, a lot of this can just be emotional. Some people don't like predestination because if predestination is true, that means that God predestined my unsaved grandma, for example. To, to go to hell and they, they think in that, those terms and that way I cannot really love God because of that that's an emotional reason um, and I can understand I can sympathize with the emotional reasoning but an emotional reasoning is not a biblical one right uh, there, there's, there are emotional things that can cloud your interpretation right especially when you study homiletics uh, you begin to realize that sometimes they, they, they are, we, we must go into the text and not let our emotions cloud the judgment so, but at the same time, I see one of the stumbling blocks is the emotional attachment behind this. 
People struggle. I, I, I've had so many people. Uh, Marcus here, he struggled with this. He would tell you that he struggled with this. When we, we initially went through this, he, could, he struggled. I mean, I hope you don't mind me sharing Marcus. Yeah. He, he struggled with it. Like he, he, just, just, he kind of knows it is true, but he doesn't want to accept it. But now, of course, he, he accepted it. Uh, Wayne, Wayne, oh yeah, Wayne, Wayne and I, we, we, for a long time, we, we're not talking, I think, one of the reasons that, you know, that he, 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 he disagreed with some of the things that I was doing was because of this issue. And then we, we only got back into connection, I think, after he told me, that, oh, now, now I see this. And I started talking. That's when we came back into connection again. Uh, but so um, the point is this causes a lot of people to stumble. In fact, I would say that everyone who has come to this position that I know of came as a result of struggling with it at first. I struggled with it. And I think a lot of it is an emotional issue that is at play. And that is why I think we have to be careful. We don't let our emotions dictate the biblical uh, interpretation. Right. So I think that's one issue. The other issue is also I think people just want to have a say in their own salvation. So it may be emotion, it may be people just want autonomy, power to control something. We feel very lost when we have no control. And if you really take predestination to the full extreme, essentially I don't have much control. <laughs> I'm at the mercy of God. For me, I'm, I've learned to be okay with that. But for some people that can still be a struggle. Does that, does that answer your question? Yeah. Any other questions? Go ahead, yeah. Yeah, sorry, two. Yeah, we go here. Uh, so brother, uh, I think how would you uh, give an answer to uh, those who you know uh attribute of uh you know we call it as responsible for their losses in terms of election? To make God responsible for their losses. Yes, uh, like, oh, uh, God elect me or elect. yes. No, that's really good. That's a really good question. How do you make God responsible for election? Now, I want to be careful that I distinguish. When you say responsible, do you mean responsible as in to cause it, or do you mean responsible in the sense that blameworthy? Yeah. Okay, thanks for that. So, now the word responsibility can mean two things. It can mean I'm responsible for this means I did this. Responsible can mean I'm also accountable in a sense that I'm blameworthy. Now, God is responsible for election. There's no doubt about that, right? <laughs> There's any doubt about that. Uh, yeah. God is responsible for election. He did it, right? That, that, that's pretty clear. But he's not blameworthy. He is not to be held accountable as if uh, that you know he did something wrong why we are all sinners so, some people say that's not fair you're right it's not fair what's fair is that all of us go to hell salvation is never fair it's not fair that jesus should die for my sins that's not fair but god has the right to dispense mercy on whomever he wills that's the argument of the next chapter romans 9 romans 9 paul says God says, I will have mercy on those I will have mercy. I will have compassion on those I will have compassion. He reserves the right to do that. What then do you say to people who blame God and say that God did this? You do two things. Number one, you acknowledge that God did do it. You cannot run away from that because I've noticed some Christians, they will dodge and say, yeah, God really didn't do it. You know, you, you did it. Now, in a sense, God did do it. But number two, emphasize the justice of God in election. Because the only thing unfair about election is our salvation. The justice of God would allow every single human being to go to hell. Every single human being. So if you're going to be upset with God, be upset about God for your own salvation. Because that's unfair. Right? But that's mercy. So I think that's how I would respond to that issue. I would, I would say that yes, God did it. But all of us are sinners. We, when we come to election, the biggest objection we have is that God picks and chooses people. The problem is that we assume this is an unfallen world. It is a sinful, rebellious world. I was debating an atheist one day, and the atheist told me, well, Sam, if you're, if you're walking past here and you see a pool, and someone is drowning in the pool, and you walk past them, you are evil. You must save. 
I said, I agree. He said, then how can you believe in a God who walks by and see millions of people drowning and he refuses to help them? I said, the analogy is wrong. The analogy is wrong because it is not just the relationship of me walking and seeing that. That guy did nothing to me. I need to help the person. But assuming I'm a king and these people try to come after me, they burn down my castle, they, they, they destroy my property and they are threatening treason against me every single day of their lives and you tell me I deserve to save them? No, they deserve to die. It's the law. Now, that's the relationship between rebel sinners. We destroy God's world by our sin. We, we, we blaspheme him with our actions and then we say why he doesn't save us. So, I, I would pin it back, the, the burden back to the sin, the sin issue and I would acknowledge that God is just in election if at all anything is unfair it is my salvation I don't deserve to be saved I hope that helps yeah go ahead brother yeah yes 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 Oh, really good question. That's such a good question. Uh, actually, I was discussing this uh, with Jason and uh, uh, Wayne. Uh, just Was it two days ago? Yeah. Two days ago, we were just discussing this issue. Uh, and I think the key is to recognize uh, that, number one, on the, there's one sense in which Christ's atoning work is for the church collectively and yet for individuals within that church individually. So the distinction, I would say, in in in, in would simply be the distinction of the visible church and the invisible church in heaven. Right? The, 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 the number of all of God's people from all times, including Abraham, Isaac, that's in heaven. But the visible church today is also the church that Jesus died for. And so in a sense, the people who are Christians today, who call themselves Christians, who I don't believe are actually saved, do partake of the same grace. They partake in the Eucharist, the Lord's Supper. They, they partake of the communion of the saints. So there are many graces that these people partake in, uh, that in, in pa being part of the fellowship of the church, that they can lose. And so one of the things that, uh, especially if you, now it, I'm not sure about the denomination structure, but uh, you know, essentially, if you, especially if you're mainline churches and all that, these people have been in church since their childhood. They've been baptized in church. They've grown up in church. I would say that those people have partook of the same grace as the believers but if they fall away that's apostasy i think hebrews 6 is dealing with that context and i think that it's very hard to read hebrews without seeing the communal aspect of church because hebrews is the same letter that says don't forsake the gathering together of the assembly and i think church is an essential concept in hebrews so i would tie that to the concept of local uh, visible universal church here on earth and people who partake in the grace that comes from that yeah thanks yeah so yeah, and by the way, the other passage that alludes to that would be 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. Uh, the false teachers who are condemned deny the master who bought them. Uh, that's another passage. And I would say those false teachers do share the same privileges as uh, the, 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 uh, the, the church. They are within the church, they're not outside the church. And so in a sense, there is a sense in which Christ has bought them. There is a sense in which they are having fellowship with the redeemed, but they are individually not really saved. Yeah. <coughs> Thanks. Hope that answers. Anyone else? All right. Yeah. Sure. Go ahead. Oh yeah. We, we, this will be the last question. Sorry, we're out of time. Yeah. How would you explain the uh, the uh, ministry of the uh, Holy Spirit in terms of conviction? Conviction? Yes. In the life of Elijah. Uh, uh, All right. Could you could you elaborate a little bit? Yeah. Uh, for the conviction of sin, I, I would say the conviction of sin is only for those who, of the elect, yes. Now, I think that, I, I want to say this, that there's also something called temporal grace, which goes back to the point that uh, I, I spoke about, where you can have people that show elements of salvation. Uh, and another example I would use is Judas, to talk about that. Judas partook in the same grace as all the other apostles, uh, but he was never saved. Uh, it's not as if he lost the salvation. 
He just never was saved from the beginning. But mind you, Judas uh, was, did do ministry under the power of the Holy Spirit. You cannot deny that. He was an actual apostle. He's not a fake apostle. And that tells you you can be an actual Christ-ordained apostle and not be saved. So I would believe you partake of the same grace. Uh, in, in many, not same in terms of the, 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 the outcome, but same as far as the church ministry is concerned. There are many people who go and say, God, we didn't, mi we didn't ministry in your name. And in many ways, they were used by the Holy Spirit to do ministry. But that doesn't mean you're saved. You know? So ultimately, the salvation, the fruits of the salvation are very important in this discussion. And I think sometimes what we end up doing is splitting the two. The conviction of the Holy Spirit truly affects those who are saved, but that doesn't negate the fact that even those within the church can operate temporarily with the, with the power of the Holy Spirit outside of that, in the sense, sharing of the same grace. Does, does, that, does that answer the question? I don't think that's an actual saving conviction, but it could be something that allows them to mingle within the body of Christ for a time being. Does that, does that answer the question? Thanks. All right. All right. I, we're out of time. I, I, I really have been blessed by this opportunity to share with you. Uh, who do I pass the time back to? Or do we just dismiss? Uh, yeah, I think that. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Sure. Oh, so sorry. So sorry. So sorry. Thank you.